get started? Yep. Hello, everybody. Um, this was supposed to be kind of a uh, informal working group uh, environment. I don't know why they put us in this cavernous room. Uh, but I would encourage you, if you're on the sidelines, to come to the table, uh, come closer. We can all talk perhaps a bit easier. And uh, uh, yeah, no reason to sit back. Uh, you're participants, not an audience. So let me introduce uh, the people uh, behind this workshop. Uh, I'll let um, Serge introduce himself, actually. He's Serge Strauss from uh, ICT for Peace Foundation. Yes, thanks, Milton. So Serge Strauss, ICT for Peace, but also the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams, whose chair I am. And because this is a topic that pops up all the time, and we need to start working on it. OK, um, so I'm Milton Mueller, and I'm from the Internet Governance Project at the Georgia Institute of Technology. We're in the School of Public Policy. My colleague uh, Hans Klein is here, and uh, also a former uh, Fulbright scholar from our uh, uh, institute, and a PhD student, uh, uh, Ilona Stadnik, is here. and. Uh, I'm not sure we have time for everybody to go around and introduce themselves, but uh, maybe uh, later on we can, we can get a sense of who else is here. I'm really glad that you're interested in this topic, and uh, we have been um, uh, pursuing this topic for about two years now. So let me explain uh, why we think uh, cyber attribution is an internet governance, uh, a critical issue in internet governance. And then we'll give you some updates, or uh, we'll let Serge take over then, and uh, as to what is happening in this space. And then we want to talk about uh, what we can do next. Okay. So uh, our interest in attribution actually started uh, with uh, the Microsoft uh, Digital Geneva Convention proposal, which. Um, we are not part of Microsoft, we are not funded by Microsoft in any way, but, and we looked at this Digital Geneva Convention proposal, and there were three elements to it, and one of them was a international treaty, the other was, was a tech accord among the private sector, and, the th and we were not too keen on either one of those ideas. Uh, we didn't think the treaty was feasible, we didn't think the tech accord uh, would be too easy for you know, two or three private actors to defect from it, and uh, uh, we didn't think that would have a big effect. We appreciated very much the sentiment behind both of those initiatives, however, and we thought it was great that a major private sector actor like Microsoft was taking uh, such a global public interest uh, uh, perspective on internet security. However, the attribution organization proposal that they made, we found extremely interesting. We thought that that was something that was actually quite feasible. And uh, they commissioned a follow-up study from the RAND Corporation about how it should be stateless attribution, that the attribution organization should try to be independent of nation states. And we looked at that, and we did some more research and investigation on the concept and we realized that this was really something uh, worth pursuing. For one thing, um, you know, when you're talking about attribution, it, the, many people think it's a highly technical thing. And of course, if you're dealing with cybersecurity, there are the technical details are extremely important in understanding tools and having access to data that is generated by uh, operating networks and, and uh, logs and so on is, is extremely important. But fundamentally, attribution is more like uh, a court coming to a decision than it is a technical process. It's about putting together pieces of evidence and having uh, a, what we might call a scientific process, or if you want to be philosophical, uh, creating intersubjective validity. That, you know, what, what is it? that you can prove that will make your conclusion appear to be valid to other people. And, and it was this intersubjective credibility that we thought was really needed in cyber attribution because 
insofar as cyber attribution is controlled by nation states entirely, then they have the problem of uh, international anarchy, the fact that no nation state can really assert authority over any other nation state. Uh, and every nation state has its own interests to look at. So we thought that the original idea of an attribution organization, an independent non-state actor was very interesting and we started to try to develop um, uh, organizational uh, capacity to do that. And one of the things we did was um, we proposed a workshop uh, at the last IGF in Paris, which was not accepted. <laughs> uh, apparently they didn't think that was an important uh, enough issue at the time. Uh, actually this workshop was initially not accepted and then somebody must have canceled and they put that in. Uh, but that's kind of a sideline, I'm digressing. And I'm not whining, I'm just uh, seeming to. Um, but anyway, um, we did some things in the context of Georgia Text, which made it clear that uh, we have severe trust problems in putting together such an organization. We have, uh, you know, the people in the West will say, oh, it's fine to create an independent attribution organization, but don't invite the Russians or the Chinese. And the Russians and the Chinese will go, yeah, but if this is run by Microsoft or it's closely connected to Microsoft, we're not going to trust it, or the U.S. government, uh, it's going to be dominated by them. So really, it's not a minor task to try to uh, come up with an independent and neutral attribution organization. But it's the, the model we went to, uh, based on our own experience, was, you know, we wanted um, DNS governance, the domain name system, and the IP address governance to be independent of states as well. So we created uh, ICANN, a, a nonprofit multinational governance institution that is more or less independent of states. And we thought maybe something like this could eventually happen with, with cyber attribution. So we, we do think that this is very much an internet governance problem and we think that we need some kind of uh, independent source to go to to resolve attribution issues. There's all kinds of subtleties about this which we'll get into as we go on. But at this point I want to turn it over to uh, Serge to talk about what's been happening in this space uh, since our initial efforts. So as, as Milton pointed out, it, it sounds easy but it's a really hard problem. And what's really hard about it is, is that there's a lot of asymmetries. Um, there's, you mentioned the political, kind of diverging political things and attribution always plays into the political area. Then uh, you have uh, resource problems. Not everybody has the same amount of resources. Microsoft has a lot more data than, than a small government may have. These are challenges. Uh, we don't talk to each other. In particular, we don't talk to each other across trust boundaries and borders. Uh, and then people often conclude that, well, attribution is a technical problem. You do the network forensics and, and stuff like that, and then you find out who the bad guy was. Well, that's not that easy. What you find out by doing that is actually which computer was used to commit a certain operation. And, and sometimes you don't even find that out. But making the step to who's actually behind kind of this last meter, who is behind the keyboard, that typically requires intelligence that the technical community certainly doesn't have. Uh, and that states are not willing to give up. So typically that's information that intelligence agencies have. That, so you need human intelligence, signal intelligence, and most people don't have access to that. And but what the reasoning was is that there is a lot of individual organizations that have parts of the puzzle and that can maybe work together. And the inspiration to me really came from, from looking at uh, how the chemical weapons people do this. If, if there's an incident that involves chemical or biological weapons, uh, different independent labs are tasked with uh, analyzing certain samples. So you cannot translate this one-to-one -to, -one to cyber, but the idea of having independent organizations, independent labs, peer review each other and come up with 
common standards of, of what makes a solid analysis seemed intriguing. And that's, I think, where, where we started to meet up because you were following on this kind of network idea. So what we did last summer, uh, generously funded actually by the German Department of Foreign Affairs, is we conducted a workshop where we invited a broad range of, of stakeholders. So we had people from governments in there, we had people from private industry in there, we had people from uh, academia in there, and we had people from civil society in there. It's, it's maybe not a surprise in here, but most people are surprised when we say, hey, you need to have civil society on board. Why is that? Because states actually in the internet go after members of the civil society, and vice versa, someone some individual can actually take down a state if he's a bit, he's a bit of luck. So you have a huge asymmetry, and we feel all of these people need to be on board. The workshop was really interesting, and a couple of conclusions that we found uh, were that it probably doesn't really make sense to create a network that focuses solely on attribution, but it should actually focus on, on what we called fact-finding at the workshop. The reason for that is that, first of all, a lot of the states said, hey, attribution is really a state activity. It's not up to the private sector or civil society to do attribution. You can argue about that, and there was a big argument about whose authority that is. But then especially members from civil society said, hey, we're actually not really interested in attribution. We're interested in effects because it allows us to find victims. And if, if we make these facts turn them into attribution, we're going to run into problems because then the victims are going to go into hiding and, and that's not what we want. And, and the conclusion really was that let's try to focus on finding facts, finding what was establishing what happened and then decide what to do with this knowledge. Uh, you can argue if this makes sense or not. That's still very open. Um, but I think those were the, the main findings. And, and the question is now, how do we move forward from here? And one of the proposals and one of the ideas that we're going to pr pursue is that we're gonna, we want to do a proof of concept where we find a couple of volunteers to take on an incident that's not too political and play this through. How does it work if you have different stakeholders collaborating, working on an analysis, peer reviewing each other? Can we do it? What are the obstacles? What are the challenges? Uh, that's where we plan to go. And there we plan actually two workshops, one organized by you guys, by Milton, and then later in the year, one again organized by ICT for Peace in Switzerland, where we kind of try to follow up on this idea. Right now, honestly, we have more questions than we have answers, but we do feel we need to move away from uh, cyber attribution being a single state or UN government or, or run organization. We feel that just doesn't have any future. Can, can you give a reference to the workshop you mentioned funded by the German Foreign Minister? Yes, so that was the ICT for Peace workshop conducted last August. I, we, we can distribute the link. We have a report, a public report about the workshop, also with, with the participants and the outcomes in a little more detail. So I would um, jump in here to uh, flesh out the debate about um, fact-finding versus attribution. Um, we, I think, uh, were pushing for uh, more of a focus on attribution as opposed to fact-finding because what we fear is that um, you'll lay the facts out and then governments and others will opportunistically use those sets of facts to draw the, whatever conclusions they want. It's kind of like the, uh, the missile um, Ukrainian uh, missile that shot down the airplane. Um, you know, you just lay out the facts and uh, the Russians will say, well, you can see that this clearly did not come from uh, our forces. And then the other people will say, you can s clearly see that this, um, this came from, uh, from the Russians. So, and obviously that's 
any, even if you went the additional step and made an attribution, that, that will be contested. Um, but we think the whole point of having this independent network is to make that final conclusion to, uh, so that others, you know, at least have to engage with the responsibility um, in a way. And the other issue I think that's an interesting one that we've debated is um, uh, uh, Serge made a really excellent analogy when we were talking um, when he said that uh, the certs that he works with um, are like firefighters and firefighters don't try to decide who is the arsonist or find the arsonist, they put out the fire, right? And so by the same token, the attribution function is not necessarily fully integrated with the C-cert or cert kind of a incident response capability. Um, so uh, even though certs could help with a lot of evidence, um, we, we don't want them to get involved in, in attribution because it kind of, uh, it could undermine actually what they, what they want to do. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, here's a, a reflection a little bit on this. I have puzzled about this distinction about attribution, is it scientific or, or otherwise? And perhaps if you make the distinction between attribution as science and attribution as a forensic act, forensic invoking uh, being similar to a judgment in a courtroom, a judge in a court has to be endowed with authority. It is, an, it, it is a position of authority, often generally public authority. So it does make some sense when states claim that the act of attribution is a state function, only they can do it, that makes sense if the act of attribution is like a judge in a, in a, in a courtroom making a forensic act. So there, that, 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 this is my own thinking out loud a little bit. It helps me perhaps understand why states have been so adamant that they possess the, the attribution function, because attribution is an act of public authority. I agree, and I, I some, and also disagree with that uh, way of putting it. Um, and again, again, I think this is a very interesting debate. So <clears throat> when I hear states say, uh, we should be doing attribution, what I hear, and I've heard this from three or four different states, uh, is that attribution is a political act. Uh, and what they mean by that is that the governments want the strategic uh, flexibility to make an attribution or not insofar as it serves their interests, right? So they may actually think they know who did it, but the statement, are we going to make a public attribution, uh, is going to be a political calculation. And it could be also a false attribution based on political characterizations. So what I like to tell the states uh, who say this is that it's not a political, uh, it's not a political function. It is a scientific function in the sense that um, it, there, is, there is a truth about who did it and who didn't do it, and we want to get at that truth. Whether you choose to do something about that, what you do about it politically, uh, is a completely different question. It's kind of like the, the firefighter attribution of the arsonist distinction. Uh, you might use this attribution to organize collective action among a bunch of other states. You might do nothing. Uh, there's all, a whole range of different options that you could use, but the actual attribution is uh, not political, I think it's scientific. And we, I think, at least in our perspective on this is that we want to take away from states the ability to manipulate or play politically with attributions and make it more scientific. I have a question over here. Or well, a comment to this. Um, well, if you look at the judge, um, you might want to again. identify yourself first, uh, I'm not sure. yeah. Yeah, so um, then the point of the judge is that the judge should be, or is, co is meant to be independent of the parties, uh, and by this uh, creates the authority. Um, that's what a state should um, ensure, that the judge is independent. It's not happening in all the countries, it's not uh, true everywhere, but that's the core idea. So. Um, 
this is uh, where the authority of the judge is coming from. That's not part. That's not a party, and it's actually answering this. It shouldn't be political. It should be independent. Uh, it should be no interest of the person who is uh, or the organization who is attributing. And uh, by this, then you can go to the fact finding or um, analogy with the judge. But if you look um, at interstate actions, where we are, the example was coming from. Um, then it's probably more like an interstate uh, action or interstate judge, uh, more like arbitration or something, which doesn't have to be uh, state-based. It could be with the UN, but it didn't, didn't have to. It could be uh, actually a good uh, civil um, uh, yeah, process from somewhere else or something, or even multiple ones. So I think this really touches on one of the, the big issues I have. In, in the internet, not everything is between two states. It's uh, what keeps me in my day jobs the most busy is actually not state attacks, it's criminals. And we do see certain actors or countries pushing out a lot of crime. And I don't, I don't want to go to an international court and accuse a certain country of fostering crime, but I want to kind of demonstrate to this country, hey, maybe you should clean up the mess you have in your place. And, and typically, Countries that push out a lot of cybercrime are also the, the ones that suffer the most from, from crime. So there is this mutual interest and there's a lot of levels of attribution and, and it, there's just the one state versus state is a very small one. And then also, again, when we say we do only technical attribution versus human intelligence, it, it depends what you want to do with, with the attribution and that's why we chose fact finding. If you just want to take down a botnet, Maybe it doesn't really matter who, who was behind it. You just want to take this thing out. If you want to arrest someone, you better know who it is. So, so I'm actually working in a blockchain context where we usually have no idea who the person is. So um, uh, it doesn't really matter if it's a state, if it's a, a criminal, if it's uh, somebody. Uh, the question is, was it correct or was it incorrect or what actually happened and all. So, um, but I wanted to... It is something like forensic, what, what uh, you have to do to get uh, to the point where you can attach an attribute. So That's part of it, but it's yeah. not all of it. Speaking of attribution, can, can we find out who you are? Well, I'm Eva Stöber. I'm a governance architect for blockchain, more or less. So okay. I'm a German. Um, I don't know what else do you want to know. I have a background in law and in computer science. Okay, governance uh, architect. Okay, so we have two people that want to speak. Uh, first, I'll go to Juan, is it? Yes. Yes, my name is Juan Fernandez. I'm from the Ministry of Communication of Cuba. And also, I was advisor to the designated expert on the GGE of 2016 to 2017. And I'm doing the same now for the open ended working group. I want to thank. Um, Milton, and I, I believe you gentlemen, you are from ICT from, for Peace. Yes, I'm a good friend of Daniel from many, many years back, and I'm following your, uh, your work in this, because uh, we feel, and we said so in the 1617 GGE, that attribution is essential in the discussions going on, especially when it's dealing with how we interpret international law in the face of uh, in, in cyberspace. There's a big argument and, uh, well, you will see it because Cuba contribution will be public and also some other country has the same concern that we have concerns when it was stated in the previous GGE that, by the way, it was close groups and Cuba was not a member, so we have to take with a grain of salt what was agreed in the 13 and 15 GGE when they said that international law and the charter of the UN applies in its entirety. When they put it in entirety, it's in a sense, it gives the idea that it's as is. And we say, we argue that in the case of Article 51, we have two main problems. First, it's when it's equivalent for, of an arm attack in cyberspace, the equivalent of arm attack in order to trigger Article 51. And then is the question that deals with attribution. Who is really the, the culprit for this uh, attack? And in this, as you know, it's, it's really, 
in, in cyberspace is, is especially important because even in kinetic world, we are familiar with the false flag operations in order to trigger some uh, counter responses. And this is more easily done in cyberspace in which computers from one country are used from other country to attack a third country. We feel that that is that link with the possibility of invoking the Article 51 is a serious threat to, threat to the international uh, security in the world, not only in cyberspace, but in kinetic world. So having said that, I really appreciate the work you're doing, and we should put this topic of the attribution on top of the list. Having said that, I only want to say to comment, because I know this is a complicated way of how to really do it. My first comment is that, as you may know, from the technical point of view, or science point of view, uh, attribution, it's the tools are getting more um, effective, and maybe it's not solved, but it's nearly being solved from a technical point of view. The problem that we have is that we have a sort of catch-22 thing, that the evidence that are, that are acquired with those tools, those who gather them, either be states, their own forces of state, or either some independent organization that for profit uh, do this, don't want to show it, because then show the capability, and that could trigger a way of circumventing, and it will create a sort of arm race in the cyberspace of, of hiding and, and attributing. So we have a sort of catch-22. I mentioned during that 1717, uh, GGE, that maybe we should do something like an uh, organization, as you say, independent, that function like a notary, like an escrow, in which uh, the evidence are presented but are not disclosed. The, they only rule on the validity of that uh, evidence. Of course, this is only uh, one way of doing it. But it, whatever the way that you do it, then we have, as you said before, Milton, the science part. It's, it's, it's a science part. But then the rest of the, that goes from there is totally political, because the next one is, is trust. Because if this mechanism is not trusted, then how will we deal with denial? You mentioned these uh, things that happen even in the kinetic world, in where is denial of, 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 of evidence. So we have to deal with trust. And in that case, we will have to devise a way in which every country or every interest party should be represented in a way to ensure trust in the rulings. And even if, we, if that is achieved, there we have to think, or this institution, a way of dealing with denial. And that will be the end of this mechanism, because the, this mechanism is, uh, you, you make the parallel of the court. You know, maybe you rule only the culprit but it's not a sentencing court. The sentencing court should be United Nations or, or maybe the, this Security Council or, or whatever. It's out of the purview of this organism. So I again thank you very much. I'm sorry I don't have answers, more questions than, than answers, but well, it's, it's a good, important work to do. You, you have raised a lot of uh, interesting questions, so I'm gonna try to uh, summarize those because um, I think they will feed into what other people said before I get to, was it you that had your hand up? Yeah, okay. So number one, um, yes, uh, this is a big problem. I, I think the Article 51 debates from the GGE, that's way over our heads, okay? That's, uh, that's war and peace and uh, we're, <clears throat> again, we're not trying to solve that problem. <laughs> we'll let you solve that in the UN, but uh, um, the, uh, the more important point you think uh, you made, I think it relates to the same point that the governance architect made, who refuses to give us her name, so I can't refer to it. Uh, I said Eva Stöbe, okay, but, uh, sorry. it's a Eva. German name, sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, Eva. So, um, so the states are developing better tools and methods, this is true. Uh, Georgia Tech's uh, computer science department is a contractor for some of these. Um, they do a lot of research, but you're right, they will not reveal their, the, the, they will not give you the data and because they don't want to reveal their sources and methods. So one of the good uh, developments that's happening in this space is the formation of the Cyber Peace Institute, which is, uh, uh, has support from Microsoft, but is not controlled by Microsoft and other um, 
big players in like financial, uh, like MasterCard, uh, I think is, is, is supporting it. And so these entities would have data and may be able to help a, an independent and neutral uh, process uh, with data that would be drawn from their own uh, substantial forensic capabilities, but, uh, and hopefully a, an independent source could use this data and, and make independent attributions. But again, to go back to the point that Eva made was, um, she was saying that a, a domestic judge is indeed supposed to be independent, but when you get to interstates, again, we have this problem of anarchy and there's no judge that sits above them all, which is precisely why we're, we're proposing this uh, neutral entity. Okay, enough from me. Now let's go to the other question and then we'll go to East. Can I first? Uh, mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Emanuel Kampitakis. I'm here in my capacity as a member of the Chaos Computer Club Karlsruhe. Uh, we are part of, uh, of the civil society organizations in Germany. Um, the, the questions you have raised about attribution is, I find them really interesting because you were speaking about fact-finding and uh, in my technical understanding, I'm not a forensics ex expert, uh, but many people in our, um, in our organization are. And speaking with those people, uh, what they, they always say attribution is hard. And hard as in it's unsolvably hard, because every evidence you have is incidental at best. And every evidence you have could be, in theory, falsified easily. So you could have an actor based in Pretoria that pretends to be uh, an actor sitting in Novosibirsk, that pretends to be an actor sitting in Alabama, and continue the chain uh, and steps, and you no longer know from where it comes. Um, that, in the backlight, that NATO says that cyber attacks um, warrant, uh, warrant uh, retaliation, um, I think only, pre only thinking that you can attribute an, a cyber attack to a single actor, uh, especially a state-sponsored actor, is a, is a very, very dangerous way to go and will jeopardize in the end uh, the the lives of human of humans in this world, and I think that it's uh, aside from mm, it may be that that actor. I wouldn't go so far as to say it's it's a judge or an international organization that definitely 100% says it was actor X Y Z. We see that as a very very dangerous step. Thank you very much. So let me take this. I know that we always say attribution is really hard and, 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 and because in the internet you can claim to be a dog and no one notices and stuff like that. And in some cases this may be true. We have criminal gangs in the physical space that haven't been caught for years. We have criminal cases that have never been cleared out and we'll have these in cyberspace and we'll probably have more in cyberspace than we have in physical space. But people make mistakes and you can find people. You can arrest people and again the confidence you need in, in terms of attribution will depend on the, re on, on the response you're going to give. If you're going to nuke the adversary, you better be really super sure. If you're just going to take down an adversary's infrastructure, maybe you need less. But the fact is, you can do a lot of technical attribution, and then moving from the technical to the, the human attribution, i.e. finding the player behind it, that's going to be a challenge. But again, it's not only states versus states. In many cases, it's crime. It's maybe I've dealt with incidents where the entire infrastructure of my, the company I work was taken down. And, and we could do attribution, and it turned out it was a student that did an experiment he shouldn't have done. Uh, we're not going to nuke him, but it was good to know what was happening because it actually de escalates. We can say, hey, this was only a student, this was not a state sponsored action. If, if we talk about norms, if we talk about cyberspace should, is not free of law, then we need to be able to kind of find out who the actors are. And I think 
governments today have an interest in keeping everything nebulous because it gives them the opportunity and the possibility to do all kinds of things they would never ever do in, in physical space. So yes, it is hard, uh, but no, it's not an unsolvable problem. It's unsolvable if you want to have it in every case, for every act, for every operation. You may leach may vary. We, we need to move forward, and that's the whole point of this, this network, that we actually have not just one entity with a vested interest saying it was actually that guy over there, and that guy over there says, I don't believe you. It's a community of peer-reviewed organizations saying, yes, we agree, this is a solid analysis, and it's very, very likely that it was that actor, and it was not this one. All right, we have a, com uh, our queue for speaking is getting very large, so uh, I know I have EC, Choi, is that right? Yeah, and uh, wait, hi. wait, wait, don't go yet. And then we have James Gannon, and then what is your name? Torsten. Torsten? Torsten. We have uh, Mark. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, so, so this gentleman you're... with a mustache back there, what's your name? What? Vladimir. Vladimir. Okay. Um, you have Andrew. Andrew Konak, right? And then um, I, for, I forgot your name. Uh, tell us your name. Uh, Hong Zhaowen from China. Okay. And we got Marty. Martin. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people. Uh, and then we have Eva again. So uh, that's eight. So uh, keep in mind that we have about another uh, 40 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, we only have 20 minutes, but um, I'm assuming we can just overstay our, our thing here. But go ahead. Keep it brief. Thank you. Hi, my name is Choi from South Korea Internet Governance Alliance. I have the opportunity to uh, give a talk at an uh, APNE meeting in Chiang Mai, Thailand, uh, several months ago. I covered the issue of how our IP address and cross-border cooperation is important to resolving cyber attribution challenges. But I uh, happened to meet a uh, guy who is a uh, work for the uh, attribution in Thailand. But it's not, it's not exactly based on Thailand, but uh, uh, he said that um, uh, we, when I uh, introduced some kind of Sony case, Sony attack from North Korea, and uh, he said uh, the attack got through the Thailand, and then it took a lot of time to trace up who, who did it, and then there's so many uh, very vague connectivity, and then the evidence, to, uh, the, according to his uh, knowledge, the, to get connected to several uh, facts and evidence and clue, it took a lot of time. And then, then uh, my point is that uh, how we cut it down, the kind of the uh, inefficiency. The attribution, uh, attribution comes with very much intolerable inefficiency. That's the point I want to make. And when it comes to norm, and second point is that when it comes to we. Even though there is no cyber norm globally to, uh, when it comes to attribution, I, my point is that what if, if there is norm, how can we carry it out? How can, because uh, I met so many technicians in APNIC, there's so many uh, uh, IP addresses, but IP address does not comply with any physical jurisdiction cross-border at this moment. IP address is just numbers, but nobody knows where, where is the, exactly this number located at physically. What if it's just IP address just changed by some tools, moving IP, anything? IP address can be manipulated, can be hired. This is exactly the biggest issue of the uh, cyber attribution must solve because uh, IP address is very much unclear and manipulated and does not comply with any jurisdiction. And even though, even though, for example, the South Korean authority have some uh, authority to carry out some attribution process in this southern area, but the uh, IP address does not match with inside of South Korea. That has the biggest issue today. And then I want to ask you kindly about your opinion about this very tricky question. Thank you.
Well, IP addresses are assigned to particular internet service providers, so typically we know uh, what block of numbers is given to which ISP. There are various ways of spoofing them. There are various ways of unraveling how they are spoofed. Um, this is not, again, an unsolvable problem. Um, let's go on to James Gannon. Thanks, Milton. James Gannon. I work on security policy within critical industries. So a couple of quick points and then a, a question or a challenge maybe. So first of all, states may want to be the, the, the main actor doing attribution, but the reality is in, at the moment it's, most attribution is done by private sector organizations. Um, secondly, talking about interstate and state to state um, attacks, with the exception of maybe four state actors, the private sector is by far more sophisticated and advanced. If you look at some of the, the cybercrime actors out there, they are by far the best paid and most capable threat actors out there at the moment. Um, and thirdly, so as somebody who's went through a number of attribution exercises with private sector companies, what is really needed, and if uh, me and Milton have debated the, the attribution piece for a number of years, so I'm really happy to see that it's getting more operationally focused. But if you want to really know what the industry, and if there's anybody else here from you know, the private sector that works on this, it's the framework that's missing. And really, I would make the suggestion, if you haven't already, if you think about it in terms of what the, the MITRE Corporation does for CVSS, where they have a very high level framework and a database of tracking actors and vulnerabilities. If you applied those same principles to attribution where you came up with a high level framework of how attribution could be analyzed or assessed, and then also had a, a centralized way to actually record those attributions or those indicators of attribution, because at the moment, depending on who you talk to, if you talk to CrowdStrike one day and FireEye the next day, you're going to actually have the same APT between different actors, and there's no centralized way to actually record that. And that's a big problem for, for those who are actually being attacked. So I, I think something in the, the realm of the governance of CVSS that MITRE Corp does could be a really good framework to base something around. I think it's a really good suggestion, James, and I, I know that, in fact, uh something that's been talked about uh, in, in the original Microsoft uh, proposal. We were talking about standardizing these kinds of uh, principles and methods. Uh, and I think uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say that the idea to do that is there. I haven't seen any progress on actually doing it. So that's something we'd really like to get underway. And, and maybe the Cyber Peace Institute would be able to help with that. OK, Thorson. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a couple of comments. Uh, the first, uh, Thorsten Jelinek, I'm, I'm director of Taiche Institute, we're a think tank, uh, actually focusing on China and all, uh, and all various aspects, including uh, cybersecurity, uh, also AI governance, ethics, etc. Uh, first, the open-closed debate uh, about uh, that some of the agencies would not disclose their methods and tools and research. Actually, I think last week or two weeks ago, there was this OECD cybersecurity activity in London, and uh, there was the um, NCS, NCS, uh, NCS, See, uh, with uh, Mr. Martin and uh, Ansi, and they from France, uh, both uh, quite leading uh, institutions in Europe, and in fact, they actually reversed that. In the past, security has been always a patch. It's always secretive, and uh, in France, it was always, by default, everything is secret, and you had to apply if you wanted to uh, publish something in a journal. Now, he reversed it uh, and said, okay, everything we do is public, yeah, and you have to justify why you don't want to publish it. Of course, there's a kind of a hierarchy of research they're doing uh, in the cybersecurity space, but uh, they have found out that uh, they will lag behind if they keep it secretive. So, uh, and, they, so it's, uh, and, and they made a risk analysis and they found even if they publish things, it has not a negative impact on the cybersecurity issue. So that's the first comment. The second comment is that um, the uh, state-sponsored um, uh, state sponsored versus cybercrime, state-sponsored is tax cybercrime. I think it's very difficult to, to differentiate, right? Because uh, state-sponsored could be a crime, and <laughs> you have a lot of this. So I think uh, uh, that makes it also uh, uh, difficult. Uh, uh, in terms of attribution, a third comment I have is uh, actually it's a big business, isn't it? I mean, in the US, over 60% of the uh, b businesses are insured against cyber 
uh, intrusion, cyber crime, and uh, if we don't know how to, uh, you know, formalize and how to um, have um, rigorous systems in place, then you have to ask these insurance companies because they evaluate those companies. It's a premium, so it's a big risk for the insurance companies. So there are, you know, it becomes a business. And usually, in terms of attributing, I would agree uh, it's not easy, and it's still probably not easy, but the combination, I mean, to find the computer where, you know, a, a virus or worm has been launched, but uh, it's a series of variables, right? What kind of uh, uh, attack it was, uh, and uh, what did they want to achieve, etc. And then with these variables, it becomes quite clear who's behind that, uh, if it is about a state-sponsored state uh, activity. Um, last but not least, uh, the fourth point I would like to raise, uh, I've noticed, and probably most of you as well, that uh, maybe it's changing now, hopefully, that the cybersecurity community and this emerging AI community, or AI security, are two different kind of sets of people. And, uh, and you see, if you look at uh, many of the cybersecurity uh, frameworks, uh, discussions, and even a couple of weeks ago when the EU launched its or uh, released its uh, 5G assessment report, and, and then Germany a week later, its 5G assessment report, and when you search through, just look for AI there, it doesn't show up a single time. If you look at the uh, NI, uh, NIST, uh, uh, the, the US National Institute of Technology uh, um, uh, standardization, uh, they launched a, a draft concept on uh, z zero, um, zero trust architecture, right? And when you look there about AI, they, they already have identified it as, a, as a something which will shift the game also in the cyber security, uh, uh, cyber tech space. So, and I think this is also maybe uh, to consider that attribution will become, again, much more complex with AI. Uh, and uh, both communities really need to work together. The AI lacks the cyber security knowledge and the cyber security community uh, has not yet really embraced uh, the AI uh, threat here in this space. Thank you. Just a note about your last point. So uh, actually the use of um, what you might call artificial intelligence or AI to detect anomalies is a big part of the technical research on, on attribution that's going on now. Yep. Uh, who was next? Let me go down to my list. Uh, <clears throat> Rodmir? Thank you very much. I have a brief question about uh, the trust um, uh, as you know, that uh, there has uh, many countries they have developed uh, their uh, attribution capabilities, and uh, if we have established uh, such a uh, impartial attribution system, how can we deal with the countries with the capability uh, already have the attribution capabilities, since they can have their own reports on attribution, and I, I think the, so sometimes it goes against with the results that's our impartial uh, systems. Uh, I think uh, I would like to hear about your opinion on how we deal with the issues, the system and the, the countries. Just a very brief answer. Ideally, they would join the network. If they choose not to do so, you have to live with the fact that someone else has a different opinion. Uh, hopefully, the network actually is trustworthy enough so that that opinion, based on facts, Always, and I mean, that's the whole point that, that we stop saying it was you. No, it was you. Yeah, that's that's, that's an excellent question, and I think um, uh, that's precisely the problem we're going we're trying to to solve. Is that every state is developing its own attribution capability, and ultimately they probably won't just abandon them. They will have their their own, but um, but there will be kind of a shared space in which these uh, attributions can be made jointly. So, Andrew. Thanks, to actually come back round. So, Andrew Cormack from the UK, which makes the discussion about courts quite interesting because in the UK, it's the jury that find the fact, not the judge, which may be something to think about. Um, <clears throat> and I wondered whether actually, separate, 
a better framing for what you're trying to do is develop a fact-finding or fact-agreeing protocol, one of the use cases for which could be attribution. And very much coming back to the last question, that existing attribution schemes can then choose to play in that protocol or not. The reason I'm saying multiple use cases is I, I suspect, and it hasn't been made explicit, there are at least two, one of which is a DOS attack and one of which is malware. And I suspect those are quite different um, and might themselves be interesting illustrations if you can do one of each rather than just saying att ooh, sorry, attribution of cyber attack. Uh, I think creation of malware, if, if you can come up with a protocol that works for attribution of malware and attribution of DOS, that, that suggests it's an interesting generalization immediately. Thanks. I think it'll certainly be, I mean, certainly part of the process of building up this network is coming up with a protocol. I, I, I like the name, that, uh, but it's just, I have called it standards of what do we feel is, is an acceptable attribution. We need to establish these, they don't exist. Uh, that's the, we laying the foundation here. We don't have the answers, but we be collecting all the important questions. But that certainly is one of the keys. If you're not, if you have no clue what you're talking about, then everything goes. Right. I see that what you're saying is uh, reinforcing what James Gannon said, uh, which is uh, we need to have these steps defined and agreed upon uh, more universally in terms of what constitutes an attribution. Uh, um, it's interesting that you're saying uh, the attribution would be one use case. What, what do you mean, what would be another one? I don't know, but there are, I think there, is, there are at least two different kinds of attribution. And I'm a mathematician. If, if you come up with a solution to one problem, that's really, really boring. If you come up with a solution to multiple problems, I might wake up. <laughs> well, it may be mathematically boring, but it might be politically or, or uh, security uh, not so boring. Uh, James, well, you want as a two-finger? Just one. Okay, go ahead. I think the, the civil society participants in the workshop made it clear. For them, it's identifying victims and helping them. It's not about, so that's a different use case. and. It's not up to me to decide what's more worthy, but different actors may have different use cases. I think that is something we need to, have, we, need, we just need to accept and it would be foolish to restrict ourselves to just one if we can actually cover more, all the better. Um, also insurance risk management, coming back to the previous point, that will be a perfect second use case. Do we have a Martin? That's okay. Martin van Hornbeek with the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams. First of all, thank you for the great session. One thing I wanted to ask about is to what degree you've already been able to work through openness of evidence. And the reason I ask is because one of the biggest challenges today with um, attribution is actually contestation. Um, pretty much every attribution that happens is contested. And that can happen by the commercial sector because they have some benefits at showing that they're smarter. It can be a state who has some benefit at reshaping the narrative and show that they're not at fault. Um, and the way that you typically deal with that is by making a lot of the evidence open. So attributions that have, for instance, indictions attached to them tend to get a lot more value than attributions that go without. Now, the problem there is that, if, that when you're investigating an incident that is, let's say, one state attacking another one, you can probably get access to evidence that you can share in some way. When you're investigating an incident that involves a human rights defender, for instance, sharing some of that information can actually put the individual at risk. So I'm just wondering, it's a very thorny issue and there's no good solutions, but I'm curious if there's already been a lot of work there. I'm, absolutely. It's again, it's, it's a question, how do we deal, there's a lot of confidential information in there, how do we deal with these, uh, especially if there's collateral damage. Courts know the concept of actually having part of, of, of a process in, in a closed setting. Um, 
I can't really answer this question in, in, in its full entity, but uh, we just can hope maybe we don't need the full amount of data. Maybe there's a format where we say, actually, all, all the members of the network have access to it, and, and that must suffice. It's, uh, but I've also seen a lot of attribution studies that actually are so conclusive that, I mean, obviously, people say we're not at fault, but no one really believes them. So, again, it's work in progress. Yeah, I would just add to that that uh, that is recognized as one of the problems we have to deal with, and it's a, it's a tough one. I, I agree with you. Eva, you were up and probably was... Oh, Vladimir, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I knew I missed a name in there, so Vladimir, go ahead. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, Vladimir Radunovic, uh, Diplo Foundation, and I agree with Martin. Thanks a lot for this amazing discussion. Um, the first point is, um, usually when we think about the consequences, and we discussed it also with Serge uh, some time ago, uh, we think about big power. So whether, you know, the U.S. is going to, um, to fire back against whoever or whether China is going to do that. But actually the small, small countries in the regions which are very uh, tense, like Africa, Southeast Asia, or Asia, or even Balkans, if you wish, they will be more and more using cyber uh, for uh, pointing fingers. And if there is no methodology or a clear understanding how this is done, the level of mistrust and even the conflicts uh, can actually explode around the world. So we're not just talking about the big powers. The, the consequences can be much bigger. Now, trying to focus on our role, I mean, our as non-governments, whether it's academics or private sector or NGOs, I think this is actually the, uh, a lot of work for us, whatever the governments are currently doing in the GG and Open Ended Working Group. And I'm trying to structure the thinking. What do we, what do we need? The first one is the framework for data and evidence is collecting and so on. And we've discussed the problems of that, where something is uh, business, something is, uh, is secret and so on, but how do we make a trusted uh, framework where the evidences can be shared, collected, and hopefully the Cyber Peace Institute can, can, could be the venue for that, but we need to find the, the buy-in of all the parties. Why would they actually uh, share? The second um, level is to develop the procedures and standards. And I mean, uh, if we look at the, the courts, back to the analogy of the courts, you have a very specific um, methodology and standards for how do you collect evidences, how do you manage them, how do you present them, and so on. How do you do the analysis? I think this is a huge work for um, te technological and legal experts to develop such a methodology, which is mainly, I guess, the academic work to some extent as well. Uh, and the third one is actually the, 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 uh, ability, the ability to, um, to provide some sort of, uh, as, as uh, uh, Martin also mentioned, the, the ability to, to um, um, explain or respond to an accusation, which is a political aspect. So do we have a mechanism like you would have in a court that you can actually say, contest the decision and say, no, no, this is not me, let me explain. Now that is again a political level, but I think the role of the scientists there to suggest uh, the, the jury or the, or, the, uh, or the judge is again our role. So I would like to underline that this is actually the role of us and let's try to, to move on with the academic and expert discussions at least on these three lines and we can do a lot while the governments are discussing the political levels. Thanks. Yeah, those are all very good suggestions. Uh, I think, um, again, our model was sort of the scientific process and in that process the contestability or, or, or debatability of the conclusions uh, should be open. So you should be able to contest and say, uh, yeah, it wasn't me and here's what we're saying and that should be taken into account. Uh, I like that uh, addition um, to the discussion. And uh, yeah, we, we've, I think, seen several suggestions that we need a framework for collecting and sharing the data and a methodology for arriving at the conclusion. All right, Eva, you will be our last. We have just run out of time, according to that timer over there, but I don't think anybody's going to chase us out, so yeah. uh, we will need to wrap up. Uh, so go ahead, Eva. And so I try to make it short. I don't think that it's always necessary to actually have one person to point to or one state or one individual or something. Um, most Sometimes it's just also... Um, uh, sensible to say, well, it's not clear, um, we don't know, um, but uh, there's some probability or maybe nothing, but uh, even then we can establish that something uh, happened and what are uh, were the risks uh, and damages involved in something uh, and who is the probability to look at, but to establish um, that other answers are less likely. 
All right, so uh, to wrap up, um, we would like anybody who's seriously interested in helping us do this to uh, give us a card and we will put you on a mailing list. And um, otherwise, I think we're done and I appreciate you all participating. Thank you. <laughs>